some of the smartest people appear to come from the most difficult backgrounds. And so I always kind of try and spread my bets on people. Every student who comes to my lab or any person, I always give them what I think would be a Nobel Prize winning project. And I think it's quite funny because I've never won a Nobel Prize and never likely to, but it doesn't stop me giving them one. And then when they fail to win the Nobel Prize or the Nobel Prize project doesn't work, we're kind of surprised and then we then make it easier. And then in the end, we make it, when it still continues to fail, we go, well, what can we do? And that's when suddenly you re- the, 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 I realize and some of my group members realize that we are really doing science because suddenly we work out what we can do that's interesting and other people haven't done. And you start climbing the mountain again, you're already halfway up because you've started in orbit and you fail to kind of some height where people wouldn't dare to go to start with. So I love being ambitious and I don't mind failing and I love to fail particularly well. I like it. And if you set huge goals, then you've still gotten pretty, pretty yeah. significant progress. Exactly. And that's why I think humanity, that's what I think for human, humanity will be fine. I mean, that's why I have four big problems because someone said, you know, why don't you just pick one? I said, well, four chances of winning a Nobel Prize is better than one. Welcome to Fringe FM, the podcast that explores the edges of human understanding and looks at the technologies, trends, and societal norms shaping our collective future. Hear the world's top minds share their insights and predictions on the convergence, direction, and ethics of exponential technologies transforming life as we know it. You can learn more and stay up to date at fringe.fm. We're looping in the era of exponential technologies, and today's guest is at the forefront of several of these fields. Today we have Professor Lee Cronin on the program. Lee's lab at the University of Glasgow is doing cutting-edge research into the manufacturing and 3D printing of complex molecules, like medicines, on demand. Lee has one of the largest teams in the world when it comes to research. He has done over 300 international talks, authored 350 peer-reviewed papers, appeared numerous times at TED and TEDx, and is really doing quite a bit in terms of trying to push push the future forward. In today's episode, we discuss how Lee believes he can create artificial life, the relationship between biology, chemistry, and our understanding of the universe, what Lee's team is looking at when it comes to 3D printing, the future of personalized and genetic medicine, the real problem with fake news, the difference between quantum and chemical computers, and much, much more. Without further ado, I give you Professor Lee Cronin. Hey guys, quickly, I would like to apologize for Lee's audio here. We did the best we could to clean it up, but that's the best we could do. It does a little get a little bit echoey at times, but at the same point, it is an incredibly interesting interview. We dive into some really deep topics, and it's really, really valuable. So we decided to leave those sections in. Now, I give you, again, Lee Cronin. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It all went back to when my father gave me a personal computer when I was eight or nine years old, called the ZX81. and. Um, I was fascinated with computing and also chemistry, and I got a chemistry set around about the same time, and I always wanted to program chemistry with my computer. And I was frustrated that I couldn't connect my chemistry set to my computer. And really, most of my entire kind of life has been kind of aspirationally trying to do that, and then also to ask how not does complexity arise in the universe, but how does information arise? Why do you differentiate between information and complexity? Um, it goes back to a conversation I had by email with Freeman Dyson, which I'm quite proud of and also a bit embarrassed about, because complexity doesn't mean anything to anyone. It does mean something to some subset of researchers, but even those researchers argue. However, if I tell you I have some information, you know immediately what I mean. I see, I see. And then t- information building upon itself, it's more information. It's not necessarily complexity. Yes, exactly. And a, a universe without life is a universe without information. But it could still have complexity? Yes, but we wouldn't be there to measure it. So it wouldn't have information because information requires the process of encoding and decoding. Interesting. So if a tree falls in the forest, does it actually make sound? How did you, how did you get into this? So for your research, you're looking into the origins of life and apparently creating artificial life. Dive, dive a little bit into what your lab is doing. I know you want run one of the top labs in the world. I don't know if it's a top one, but it depends how you metrically define it. But it's a pretty exciting place to be, a privilege, actually, to have such an interesting bunch of people. And I think that's what I've managed to create in Glasgow 
is to get people not just from chemistry and chemical engineering, but also from physics, computing science, electronics, electrical engineering, biology, and even cognitive robotics under one roof. And together we kind of try and work out how we can do wacky things in chemical space. And wacky things is a big part of what we're doing on Fringe FM. We're looking to the future, the sci-fi future that's coming. I think a lot of the research you're doing would be exactly that. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of the interesting projects you guys are working on? Yeah, so I'm, I'll, I'll probably summarize my top four projects. And so one of them you just mentioned, we want to uh, understand if we can make an artificial life form because we might understand the origin of life. The second thing is I want to digitize chemistry so I can turn code into molecules on demand and molecules into code. So I could beam you a drug rather than send it to you by FedEx. I want to make a chemical brain. And that is a chemical computer. And uh, lastly, uh, but not least, I want to understand how chemistry can encode information and use that information within a chemical system. And that may sound esoteric, but if I ask you if molecules think, you might wonder if that's the case. And then you realize your brain is made of molecules. And indeed, molecules do think. And then we kind of get into a Buddhist type world of the, the caterpillar thinking and my bed thinking and having very, very complex uh, conversations. Not quite. I th- I'm happy to stop at a simple abstraction. I don't know whether molecules are conscious. <laughs> I'm certainly we appear to be conscious, but I'm really interested in what is it about molecules that interact with one another that allows um, them to take part in an informational transfer process and a computational process that we can see in our brains. Would this, be, would this be along the line of what you've been looking into for inorganic evolution and how inorganic molecules start to change and improve themselves or try to survive? Yeah. So it's basically the ultimate, the ultimate outcome of uh, inorganic evolution with biology and the origin of life as we know it. As those organisms become more and more complicated, you get to the first cell, then to multicellular organisms, and then to organisms that have sensors and specialized sensors to process that sensory information, a series of different features seem to emerge higher and higher levels. And ultimately, the ultimate abstraction, I guess, is the human being that can imagine the abstraction. Is that the, is that the driving force for you, understanding how that happens? What's your big overarching question that led you to this world? Oh, there's so many. But I think the one that bugs me the most is, um, is why does the universe do this? A quick aside here. It's quite interesting. Science and religion, the history of humanity. It's all about answering that question of why. Why is life is here? What are We don't really understand time. We don't really understand the direction of the universe, the Big Bang going forward. Or well, physicists don't. Chemists do. The chemists don't realize they do yet. And they have a hell of a time trying to explain it to physicists. And so kind of understanding the directionality of uh, the way that information uh, processing systems have developed or evolved might tell us something about the likelihood of having of other information or processing systems in the universe, i.e. other life forms, or even if we're really extraordinarily lucky, alien, conscious aliens, if you like, and then uh, what the ultimate future might actually hold for humanity. Interesting. Why do you say if we're extremely lucky for intelligent life forms? My understanding was it should be a pretty, pretty set, uh, set 100% certainty just with the size of the universe. I, I would agree with you, but we don't have any data. And I think human beings have a great ability to extrapolate. And, you know, I'm, I live in the UK and, and we have a football team, England. Every time the Football World Cup comes along, the English think that the UK, sorry, that England will definitely win the World Cup. And of course, they haven't for many, many years. So although I share your enthusiasm, I just simply lack the data. But would it, wouldn't it be, let's say that we played the World Cup a hundred million times, a million times, a million times, a million times, a million. England's eventually going to win, regardless of how much they suck. Yeah, but that's an ill-posed question because the, there's not the resource available to play all those World Cup matches. That's the problem I have with physics and maths. It's possible for you to think of an extremely large number, a bit like if I took my iPhone and ground it up into sand, and I said to you, what is the probability that iPhone could reform? If you're a physicist, you would say... Essentially zero, but it, you okay. could they re- reform it. Yeah, you, you, you know you win, right? Because <laughs> most people say it's very small. I would say it's basically zero. And I think the same thing goes for the World Cup. Isn't that a bit of what you're looking into now, though? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're trying to find out what is the missing physics or chemistry in the physics. I don't know which way around to put it. We even mathematics in the universe that allows this to happen. 
And I think the only way we're going to do that is actually make it happen in the laboratory. I have a very simple view on making matter informational or able to process information. And that is just to do laboratory experiments where we start with simple stuff and we watch the ability for that matter, that stuff, to self-aware is the wrong term over a four billion year like um, time scale perhaps, but be able to start to compete with itself or other objects, differentiate and start to evolve. And that's your thesis. That's what you're trying to prove. How are you able to prove that? The ultimate idea would be to make a machine whereby we put in sand and the sand turns into cells. And although we've got a machine, so people say, oh, you've got a machine, so you create the machine, so it didn't really happen, we would be able to audit or essentially record how little information we needed to put in and how much spontaneous information would need to arise from the system. That would be a way of then showing how that might have occurred on Earth. And the key thing is to do a real experiment that puts the boundary conditions on the time scales. Why is that? Well, because if we don't, if I make my, say if I become, do what Craig Vent is doing, and I take a copy of some DNA from somewhere and a copy of a cell, and I make artificial DNA, and I make an artificial cell, and I manage to make a life form, I won't have actually managed to discover a life form. I would have just simply facsimiled existing biology. So what I need to be able to do is kind of imagine I've got a dead planet and watch and create the conditions or understand how the conditions could be created for life to naturally occur without any a machine mechanistic intervention that isn't coming from the basic laws of physics and chemistry. Isn't one of the popular theories of how we got life on Earth collision with an asteroid that had previous life on it? Sure. I, I, and I think that probably the, bio, the chemistry that gave rise to biology on Earth was kicked up, cooked up on Mars. And so the, the search space was larger. But actually, I think if we keep invoking that argument, we're just kicking the can down the road and ultimately falling into some kind of um, trap that whereby we have to invoke a creator. And I'm not saying invoking a creator is a trap necessarily, but um, it doesn't really ultimately lend itself to a scientific thesis. Understood. You want to find out when that time zero is and see how things have progressed. Yeah. Hey, Matt here. Just in case we lost anyone, when we were talking about time zero, we mean the Big Bang. When the universe began, essentially everything that happened after that, scientists are able to at least understand and observe or speculate about. But before that, we really have no idea what happened. So at least looking at how far back we can get and how much of the universe can we truly understand. I want to I wanna segue a little bit now into some of your work that you were looking into, essentially digitizing chemistry and the ability to 3D print medicine. Talk to me a little bit more about what the state of the art is here and where you see us moving in the future of, of personalized medicine. Oh, okay. So, I mean, as a chemist, I make molecules and I make molecules in the lab every day by, you know, well, my, my team do by mixing liquids, you know, in test tubes and round bottom flasks. And we might write a recipe down and validate that recipe and then buy the chemicals and do the reactions by hand. We might even have a little bit of machinery to help us. Frustrated by the variability the reproducibility in both success of the outcome of the experiment, the amount of material I got, and just the sheer amount of labor. We make the highly trained, dedicated PhD chemist at the bench do. I wondered if we could somehow make their life a little bit easier and capture their know-how. And actually, part, to be honest with you, I was inventing this automatic machinery to make a life form. And when I realized that this machinery could make a life form was working, I realized the ultimate or initial application would be to use it in organic chemistry to start making molecules, which are, you know, making drug-like molecules or even drugs themselves. Now, we're not literally 3D printing the molecules, but we're doing something very similar. In a 3D printer, you would load in a coordinate file and it would basically be able to draw the object with the plastic ink, as it were. In holding that analogy in your head, if you can imagine the the nozzle of the 3D printer was not now just extruding plastic, was squirting out chemicals into a test tube. We'd have full digital control of the process. Did we add A to B or B to A? Was it shaken or stirred? How long was it heated for? How long was it cooled for? All these magic tricks are suddenly recorded forever, and we can then reproduce them. And that then means we can then drop the cost of manufacture and also personalize. To do that, though, we would have to have distribu distributed uh, peer-to-peer type 
production facilities for medicine worldwide? Yes. Now to do at the moment, rather than going that, because that's a stretch, and I'm not sure that we want people doing that. Lee brings up a great point here in terms of both looking at the future, the potential challenges, and also the steps to get there. So distributed medicine, perhaps that's not where we're headed quite yet, but we will get there. The challenges, of course, being when you can print drugs on demand. You have some inherent challenges with the war on drugs and quite a few other challenges related to government's human enhancement and the potential for things to go awry. Wouldn't it be great if chemists could collaborate over the world? And let's just say if I made a molecule in my lab today and I wanted to beam that molecule to another lab to check that it was the drug I hoped it would be, rather than the other lab having to take many months to reproduce my synthesis, and it could typically take that because of the ambiguity, they could reproduce it immediately, and that would transform even drug discovery on that timescale. What about patents and intellectual property? Well, it transforms it because if I make a new molecule in my lab, I can digitally sign it. So suddenly I've got proof of discovery. I put the code into a repository. I could even make a blockchain, so make it sign it public, so how people modify it. We could do all sorts of things. We're using digital rights management. I'm personally fascinated with blockchain. That's why we're having Kyle Samani of Multicoin Capital on the program to discuss the implications of blockchain and decentralization and how it affects governance and compute and much, much more. So it would change the way patents are, are prosecuted, but I, don't think, I think it would enhance collaboration because I'd, make a, I'd be able to chemify my secrets. So just like if I was a music artist, I'd hope that I could put my music onto Spotify and every time someone downloaded, I would get some payment. What about if I, made, if I chemified it and I could make an iTunes or a Spotify for chemistry so that when people realized that my molecule was the best one for a particular job, Rather than competing, they just downloaded that one, and I got paid for that. It's a very interesting future. I know you're working a lot with trying to, to speed the process as well for chemical, uh, chemical discovery and medicine discovery, because right now it costs something like a, a billion dollars. Is either a billion or a hundred billion dollars to bring a drug to market? How do you yes, think- about, it's, it's a billion or 800 million, depending, but the, the, the majority, only a small amount of that money, well, a small amount, $200 million worth is all spent on the chemical part. A lot of it is spent on regulation, manufacture, and probably the most important is clinical efficacy and safety. Are you looking at any potential ways to expedite those processes as well? I know you have a, a mad scientist type brain. <laughs> um, I, wouldn't, I, I, I do like to think out of the box, I would agree. I'm not sure that I, I know how to expedite that necessarily, but I think by making the ability to make molecules more democratic, what I think we'll be able to do is give other people better qualified than me who work in pharma, pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, molecular biology, the way of really inspecting what's going on in cells in real time. Imagine, let's say, you know, let's not imagine you, but someone you knew got cancer, bad news. But then suddenly the good news is you could take those cells from them, grow them, if you like, in a Petri dish or in a 3D printed tissue and then in real time, test different uh, molecules you've just made in your robot against those cells or some kind of optical output and then have feedback. And then you could personalize the approach to killing that particular type of cancer. And I think this is where perhaps this approach will be useful because individual, everyone's cancers are an individual. That's why it's such a complicated disease. And maybe this approach could help that. Interesting. So as opposed to as opposed to the Hollywood movies where we're cloning ourselves and then stealing our own organs, we're just cloning part of our DNA so that we are able to have enough material to test on for different for different processes. Yeah. And I think that that part, that future is probably a little bit closer than cloning. our. What time frame? How long do you think? Well, it, everyone asks that and I always get into trouble because I, I think about the practical time and then there's an impractical time with regards to cultural inertia, which I never understood when I was younger. And um, we can do it now, I guess, or in two or three years if we had enough money. I think it will probably take a much longer, maybe a generation or more, simply because we need to get the regulators on, on side. And also we need to demonstrate uh, the efficacy of the, the entire process. But I'm hopeful that... Once we start to chemify chemistry and my computers come out there and we democratize, that the way of inventing m- molecules will go up so dramatically, the number of drug candidates will also go up dramatically and there'll be a Moore's law of molecules and drugs. 
and the convergence with genetic genetic testing to be able to sequence human genomes and look for look for specific traits etc exactly and you How can have you, you i mean one day you'll be wearing a device that might even be able to gene you uh, sorry uh, sequence you on the fly day to day and say oh my gosh you've got the, you, you've you've accrued, you've accrued these mutations over the past week and you could do that because you wouldn't need that much data. You would only be looking at the changes, the differentiation. Who knows? I mean, I reckon, you know, in the future, if you could just sequence everything, wouldn't you? Probably. So <laughs> you, you kind of have a pretty incredible job. You look for interesting problems to solve. Here we'll jump into Lee's childhood a bit, where he had a bit of a tough time growing up, especially when it relates to school. I wanted to point this out because even though he's accomplished so much, he did have to overcome great challenges. I think that's important for us never to forget and never to idealize. I was looking into into your background in the past and I saw that you had some trouble in school and that this kind of led you down a positive route. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, I don't know if I, I mean, I, people say, you know, I mean, we, we had trouble at school. I was in the learning difficulties group at school and I never really understood at the time how much trouble I was in, if you know what I mean, <laughs> looking back <laughs> now. But in fact, it was the way that probably enabled me to approach uh, science the way I approach it and indeed had I been at the top class in school probably I would have been too worried about failing all the time however when you when you're you do nothing else than fail or come last um, then no one has any expectation of you so when no one had any expectation of me I was able to carry on and just do what I wanted and what I was interested in and that you know I think I invented my you know I'm not very smart I think I just invented my smartness by or my abilities or whatever by climbing an educational mountain, as it were. And I think that that for me was, uh, so I kind of own the problems a little bit more. My curiosity is genuine. I'm not worried about what people think of me. Most people, I guess, who meet me think I'm quite stupid. <laughs> However, I'm I about that. Why do you think Lee's been so successful? My money's on the fact that he didn't have to follow societal norms. He was able to shape his own path, so to speak, and follow, follow his passions. I think this is incredibly important and society and school system do not do a good job of. That's my question for you. What are you passionate about? What should you be pursuing that you're not? Well, I don't know. I mean, in academia, I'm, you know, I, I don't mind asking silly questions. But that's because you're smarter than other academics and willing to look dumb because you know it makes you smarter. No, I, no, I, actually don't. I genuinely don't think that. I just think I, I'm happy being me. Uh, growing up was hard um, or growing up would have been hard had I realized how screwed I was. <laughs> but actually, I just solved, just solved problems. So I remember when I was at primary school and I realized I was in the learning difficulties group and there was no way of proceeding to high, when I went to the high school this is when you, in the UK when you're about 11 years old. And they just said, you know, when you go to high school, you're going to be in learning difficulties group there. There's no chance to progress. And I was like, well, why? And they said, well, because you're not very good. And I said, well, what do I need to do? And I think I just... This is when I'm faced with a problem, I just break it down into problems and solve that problem, line all the problems up in difficulty or importance and solve one after another. And before you know it, there's no problem anymore. And then you have one of the largest multidisciplinary uh, chemistry research labs in the world. How is how is your your challenges impacted how you look at education and the future for humanity? Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer either of those questions. I can tell you what I... I, I, one of the things that I was uh, I found unexpected about being a professor was obviously you just want to have the, all the smartest people in the world come and work for you. But what I realized is that actually some of the smart, and I should have known better, some of the smartest people appear to come from the most difficult backgrounds. And so I always kind of try and spread my bets on people when they come to my lab. So I like to have a mixture of people who are top of their class and people who didn't do so well but basically show a genuine spark. And so it, my approach to education and to belief in humanity is not to consign anybody by, the, by their current limits, you know, by confine them. And so often I, every student who comes to my lab or any person, I always give them what I think would be a Nobel Prize winning project. And I think it's quite funny because I've never won a Nobel Prize and never likely to, but it doesn't stop me giving them one and then when they fail to win the Nobel Prize or the Nobel Prize project doesn't work, we're kind of surprised. And then we then make it easier. And then in the end, we make it when it still continues to fail. We go, well, what can we do? And that's when suddenly you re the, 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 I realize and some of my group members realize that we are really doing science because suddenly we work out what we can do that's interesting and other people haven't done. And you start climbing the mountain again. You're already halfway up because you've started in orbit and you fail to kind of 
some height where people wouldn't dare to go to start with. So I love being ambitious and I don't mind failing and I love to fail particularly well. I like it. And if you set huge goals, then you've still gotten pretty, pretty yeah. significant progress. Exactly. And that's why I think humanity, that's what I think for human, humanity will be fine. I mean, that's why I have four big problems because someone said, you know, why don't you just pick one? I said, well, four chances of winning a Nobel Prize is better than one. <laughs> I like it. Is that, the, is that the goal, a Nobel Prize? No. <laughs> but clearly, um, something that my peers like and I feel that is, you know, interesting to the world, but probably more, more often my, I guess if I'm being brutally honest, my ambition is to discover something that just was completely unexpected and to find something genuinely new about the universe because of the activities that we have taken because of, you know, my attempt to peel the onion with a new idea. I think that's my mission in a way. I would really love to do that more than anything else. And if it wins prizes or whatnot, then great. If not, if I've genuinely peeled the onion and found a new reality or contribute to a new reality, that's probably quite enough. I think that would be pretty solid success. I like that you focus on peeling your own onion. You pick the onion that you want, the problem that you want. Do you think that that is a big part of the reason you've been successful? And how do you think about that in terms of how other people choose careers, futures, education paths, etc.? I think it's really important. I mean, I do believe there's just one onion, right? There's a one onion of, of the universe. And, but I do think that it's, isn't it interesting that having ideas, original ideas, gets to the truth and, and different ideas. And I think that that's why I try and encourage people to think about in, is, is not to just copy what other people are doing. I read the literature. I find it hard to read the literature. I don't really care what's in the literature that much, to be honest. I care what's not in the literature. What can I do that's new? And not just new, predictable, but unpredictable, discovering stuff. That doesn't mean that people who improve stuff or people that do, you know, take, choose a particular endeavor they can see it is any less worthy. It's just it doesn't excite me as much. And I'm not able to sell it as much to get funds to, to captivate other people's minds. And I think my genuine enthusiasm for finding interesting problems has helped me build the team I've built. Speaking of selling it, so you guys have 35 million in grants and 15 million a year in, in uh, income coming through patents, et cetera. Is that right? No, no. So I think, so I think I've, I, which way around is it? It's, I think I've raised so far in my career about 35 million in total. And the current income in the group is about 15. But I'd love to raise it through patents. That would be awesome. <laughs> ah, so I thought, I thought that was recurring revenue coming in, and that would be very no, solid. No, no. I mean, if we were managed to do that, I think um, probably I'd be boring really quickly. Talk to me about how, how university-based and research-based science works. A lot of people aren't in the field and don't understand the system. So can you break it down quickly? Sure. Normally, starts, you start off as, a, a say, an associate professor. You have a small amount of money. Um, and the job really is to turn that small amount of money into some really extraordinary results that people then start to trust you. And therefore, you can then get good people and equipment and then start to be more exuberant in your ideas. And then you write grants to build a team and you would apply to multiple organizations outside the university, say to medical charities or to engineering organizations that have money to give grants to universities, be them funded by the taxpayer or by industry, or by philanthropists, and, and you're competing with your, your fellow scientists. And what would happen is you write a proposal, my latest great idea. So what proposal I'm writing right now is on the chem brain, it's called the chemical brain. And uh, I will then, you know, uh, explain why it's an important proposal. I want to make a chemical brain. I don't want to understand how a human brain works. That's being done. Why don't I make a chemical one? I then, you know, explain how I might do it, what the hypothesis is, and uh, I write the best proposal I can based upon my expertise, send it to the, these organizations, which are, there are a lot in the US, less in the UK, but still a large number. They will then be peer reviewed um, by my peers. So pe other people are competing for money. So it's kind of like a hardest environment you can imagine. And they will, they will it, anonymously tell the organization whether they think you should get money or not. That, that is then then wrapped, and then you get a decision and a check or a rejection. 
sounds even more brutal than venture capital. Talk to me about this this chemical brain that you're trying to create. What it looks like. How you plan to do it. I okay. I, 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 I'll I'll t- I'll tell you the bits I think I want to be in the public right now because I've got the idea. But I'll tell you enough because I mean you know I think uh, I people keep secrets all the time. Boring. So what I want to do is I'm interested in polymers are really important in chemistry, right? They're important for uh, making uh, clothes, uh, paints soft materials my polymers are like wiggly things and they remind me of neurons in your brain and i was thinking well if i can make polymers respond to electricity or light could i use these wiggly things to um, process information and so that's what i'm going to try and do i'm basically going to try and take jello and turn it into a brain and if you get consciousness how will you react? <laughs> I, I don't think we'll get consciousness, but I think we will get a, a more flexibly intelligent entity um, that will be able to compute faster. Now, the problem with computers right now, digital computers, is they're really energy intensive. If I could make a chemical brain, a bit like your brain, your brain probably uses about, oh, I'm going to get this all wrong, but it's between 20 and 40 watts, and you have a huge amount of computing power in your brain. Whereas, you know, the average desktop computer can use 150, 200, 250 watts just running Windows. So that's obviously unsustainable. So I'd like to think about to try and redefine how we might do computing and make it lower energy, solve problems in a slightly different way, and also get around some of the bottlenecks we have with current computing paradigms. There's a lot of hype right now with quantum computing. Are, are you familiar? Unfortunately, Lee doesn't go into a lot of detail on how quantum computing actually works. And that said, it's actually quite complicated, and that's part of the reason for it. I want to do a quick breakdown here. So essentially, the difference between quantum computing and the way your computer at home works works. Quantum computing is all based off of probabilities. It's probabilistic computing that uses relativity to estimate or guess the, the best possible scenario or the most likely situation. That's a bit different than how traditional computers work in terms of ones and zeros. Yeah, I mean, I must admit that um, I thought that quantum computing was overhyped. I do think it's exciting. and I do think there are practical limitations, but I do think that quantum computing will actually make a difference. But I think that quantum computing has a specific set of problems that it's going to be good for. And there's a specific kind of resource constraint to keep to, to explore that space and also programming quantum computers and understanding the quantum is still quite hard. So I think the chemical computer I'm trying to make could be as exciting, if not, well, let's not say more exciting, as, as, let's say as exciting of, as a quantum computer, but easier to maintain in its computing state because it's gooey chemicals. What are your thoughts on a hybrid? I feel like with a human brain, we have a lot of different moving parts, so to speak. You have left brain and right brain, which is not not a very good synopsis, but there's different ways that the brain processes different information. I feel like for artificial intelligence researchers that are trying to build neural nets, unless you build something that's flexible enough and productive enough, it seems nearly impossible to create intelligent life. I think you're absolutely right, and I wish to tell Elon Musk. Well, I, I also can understand his fears because it's kind of like that thing where you, you have a child and you never know when they're going to start crawling and you leave stuff out and suddenly no, they start crawling. No. Elon Musk, I'm afraid in this, he may be a wonderful engineer, but he's quite wrong. And also peddling incoherence doesn't ha- is not really useful. It's like him saying, oh, I'm really worried that anti-gravity is going to spring up and we'll all fall off the earth. So I, can, I, I, can... I would say it's much farther away than that. I think that's a bit of a hyperbole, but that's my opinion. Why do you think that? No, no, no. I, I agree. I think we're vigorously agreeing. High, uh, anti-gravity doesn't exist and probably will never exist. And we're not going to fall off the earth. Although there might be a scenario where you can imagine that we manipulate physics in some way we don't understand. And so exactly the same problem is for our general AI and it, exactly very far away. So in silicon right now, you will never, ever, 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 ever make anything approaching the complexity of a human brain. And that's because the human brain has a trillion neurons with a thousand connections. That means there are more possible states in the average human brain than there are atoms in the universe. Now, yeah. so that's pretty mind blowing. And if that, and so I think that what we've got to try and do is work out how we might get to somewhere akin to human like consciousness or intelligence by making hybrid silicon 
organic brains. And then you need to start to worry. Are you looking into that as all as one of your next proposals? Yeah. How do you go through the process of deciding what to focus on? We've talked a little bit about what you've done and kind of how you jump into things. But I'm Brutally, gonna... if it obeys the laws of science and it really annoys people, I, try, I keep going. And the same, the same is true. How do, you, how do you decide with your graduate students what their focuses are going to be? Do you have some hand in shaping that? Yeah, I mean, the, so the students that come in, they come into the mission in the group, right? So we are wanting to digitize chemistry, uh, make artificial life, look at information processing explore and discover things in chemistry so there's really a broad kind of direction we're going in and i and i try and make that clear i will pretty much do anything for most students you know sometimes if they like you know really struggle if they try and do one particular project and they struggle or they get excited about one thing and they can convince me that i'm not going to go bankrupt i'll try and meet them halfway always because that's part of the fun you just learn so much that way but what i try and do is broadly define the direction and then we just we just run at it and we come up with lots of different ideas together and before you know it they own the problem and the and the solution much more than I do and it's to the PhD students they they hold a special place in the lab because we need to enable them to understand the process of science which means a little bit of getting lost in the kind of you know in, in no man's land as it were and finding the interesting ideas and working out how to think critically and I have some postdoctoral researchers who are paid on specific projects where there are stakeholders expecting us to do specific things. And so sometimes I have to kind of, you know, dra- drag us back to that reality. Which is always the, the less fun, but always necessary reality. I have, the, I have the sneaking suspicion that much research and science is underfunded. I feel like there's a lot more money going to easy money and a lot less money going to deep research today. Would you, would you concur? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I've also raised venture money actually in the last few years as well for ideas, and I think that certainly there isn't enough money. I don't think that's a necessarily bad thing. I think there's a sweet spot, and the the problem is, I think in the US there's probably too little money. However, if you're successful at writing grants in the US, you're you just you can build a supergroup immediately. But those uh, supergroups, it's quite hard for the PI, the principal investigator, the the scientists running them to actually do any science. They have to sell it all the time. They're running around on an airplane with a briefcase and a proposal. And I think that's going a bit too far. So I think you want to have this kind of happy medium between en- enough money to maybe underpin, but not so much money that you're not constantly being pushed to be creative. If that makes any sense? That makes sense. What about commercializing tech? Oh, I mean, I'd love to do that, right? And not because I want to... Uh, take commercial money, but I want people to be interested in what I've done. And, you know, there's all, it's okay, you know, discovering life forms and making brains or whatever it is you're doing. But if no one in the outside of your laboratory cares, then why are you doing it? And this so is, this is the big problem with science. No, I don't think. Interesting. I would not have guessed that. This ties in beautifully to the entire theme of French FM and the forever fund that I'm focused on building. If you go to foreverfunds.vc, you can learn a little bit more. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The other thing JFK forgot to bring up is that the space race drove 99% of the technological innovation, growth, and profit of the coming decades. It's incredible the amount of technology that came out of that race between the U.S. and Russia and how it's benefited all of us. For the hell of it. Now, of course, people say, oh, my gosh, the atomic bomb, nerve agents, black singularities, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I can understand those worries. And I think we are getting better at communicating what, how we are professional and trying to safeguard things. But sometimes you just should try and do the experiment and, and you know, do it openly. And maybe that stuff isn't used for years. But you know what? If the taxpayer gives me money to be a little bit crazy and just do random things, that's great. I love that. And I'm very appreciative of that. But what's crucial is if I use that money and during the process, I spot an opportunity to, that, or a technology that should get out there, I feel it's my societal duty to make sure that happens. Now, not necessarily by doing it and being an entrepreneur, because I'm a pretty rubbish entrepreneur, but I you know, might sell it, patent it, publish it, enable other people to copy it, 
go to trade shows and say, you should do this. I've discovered this widget. You should use it. It's going to change the way you think about the world and make you a lot of money. So I think that scientists need to do that a little bit more. Curiosity-driven science is brilliant. We should do it, and you should pay me to do it. But you should also expect me as a consequence of that when I find things that could be important for humanity to make sure they get out of my laboratory. Do you think too many scientists don't? No, actually, I think more and more of us do it. I think some people overdo it. Oh, my gosh. Impact before science. So many young people nowadays are telling me what the application of their science is. And I'm like, but what's the question? They're like, what? I said, what what interests you? And they're like, oh, I want to make a battery. I'm like, that's a bit boring. I've got a battery. (laughs) What about, you know, telling me if wormholes exist? And they, and, and I mean, I feel bad because I'm pr- kind of making fun because it's great they want to make better batteries and it's great they want to make better drugs. But I believe if the taxpayer pays me for curiosity, I will pay the taxpayer back with technology. That's probably a good quote. But are they paying you for curiosity or are they paying you for results? No, I think they need to pay me to, for curiosity and I think they need to trust my results. Well, when I'm young... You, tr- you just give me a little bit of trust because I'm young and I deserve a chance. And then when I get to a certain part in my career, hopefully I I have a track record. And then you then, you know, you pay on the basis of that track record. Were you super nerdy growing up? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I what guess. Were you, what were you into? What, were, what was your hobbies? I used to build computers out of household items. I think my mother's washing machine didn't survive very long. The, te- the uh, telephone, the um, TV... I tried to build a CO2 laser once. <laughs> How old were you when you were doing this? Um, I don't know, maybe maybe 10. I mean, it didn't work, right? So I re- a CO2 laser, I realized I needed uh, CO2. I didn't have any CO2. And I wasn't thinking straight. So I got a cylinder and I set fire inside the cylinder, hoping to trap CO2. And this is why you were in that special class. They were real worried about you. <laughs> Perhaps. There, that's a, that's very cool. So um, actually, very important question. How do we encourage more young kids and the next generation to look to science and to changing the future versus making a lot of money or being stuck in an iPhone? I think we just have to activate people's curiosity. And also, as I mean, humanity is now a really interesting junction. I was worrying about this earlier tonight. I have a robot lawnmower that mows my lawn. A few years ago, I might have mowed my lawn myself. And when I was too busy, I might have hired a gardener. And when I was reading... Um, something about, you know, the, um, the average American CEO doesn't expect to be giving any of his workers a pay rise, really, above inflation for years. And actually, the coming automation is coming. I was feeling a bit sad, right, for humanity. And then I realized, well, if, we're, if no one has a job anymore making things, then really, we're going to give each other jobs creating things, be it art, science, books fantasies, whatever it is, we want to, you know, you know, film. And so I suddenly got excited that really perhaps enabling humanity to be more creative and value that creativity is probably a really important. And okay, even if you're making iPhone apps, just make good ones, right? Holographic ones, R2D2 style. I think that that's really exciting that, we, that there might be a, a nexus coming soon where actually if we can solve there is a little hump we have to get over. We have to, we have to stop global warming or at least find a way to arrest it. We need to make sure everybody in the world, from the very poorest to the very richest, is educated, particularly women. We need water. All these problems are solvable in energy, and they're solvable in our lifetimes. And once we solve them, we need to do something else or we're going to be really bored. And so, really, Yeah, really bored never leads to good places. Great yeah, work. so so I can't help thinking that the creativity of the human that I see is, is not exhausted. We, are, we just keep going. So I'm really excited about, just because I can't imagine how we're going to get over the current automation crisis. Maybe if I was a weaver, you know, when, when, the, when the loom was coming and the mills were coming, maybe I'm stuck in this kind of problem right now and that the, the, the answer is coming. The challenge with the analogy is they had like 80 years of wars and civil strife. I'm not sure if we're going to have to go through something like that or if people are going to realize that we may have to start shifting to a different type system. Because once you have abundance, there's no reason to work for nothing. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we need to go. Well, I mean, this, the, one of the reasons why we haven't had a proper war, we had all these proxy wars. I mean, it's a bit philosophical for me. And we can get back to science, I guess. It's probably because as a global system, although the UK wants to Brexit and so on, we depend on each other so much. I mean, where do all our 
well, where do all our flash RAM get made? It gets made in Taiwan and Korea. I mean, you know, where it's, it's really interesting how the global system is interconnected and interwoven and how we are depending on each other in, in different ways, not for just-in-time things. So I'm really optimistic that despite all the bravado, actually things are a lot better and will continue to get better. And that's the goal of this podcast, to help make it better and to get people like you on who are building the future, transforming it and creating the, the more interesting world of tomorrow. What, uh, what areas outside of your own work are you most interested or excited about? I'm really interested to see if um, the people that are choosing to do um, kind of looking at brain chemistry and uh, imaging, whether we can actually see if a thing called consciousness ever actually does exist, because I have my doubts. I'm certainly self-aware, but I'm not sure if I'm conscious. I'm interested in that. I'm really interested to see what will happen in the in the, the the current space race we have, I suppose, space technology. Whether actually Elon Musk can actually stop talking, arguing with people on Twitter, and get on with the job of getting to Mars. And uh, yeah, I'm just genuinely fascinated by how computer science is going and how we're generating new realities within our existing physical realities. But to be honest, I'm. I'm so obsessed with my own little kind of questions here and there. And sometimes I forget about the rest of the world. Completely understand. That means you're doing the right thing. What, a, what resources, sites, blogs, podcasts, etc. do you look to daily, weekly basis to stay informed and in tune? I use Twitter, which I'm kind of getting annoyed with. I started looking generally when I go traveling. I try to talk to the students and go spend maybe up to a third of my traveling time going to student invited events. I try to kind of get lost more when I'm when I'm in digital media. I'm looking at publications and things, and get you know sidetracked and, and and try and follow questions. And often, what I try and do is I try and pick a problem I thought I solved or I thought someone else has solved. And I'm doing this a lot in maths at the moment, and I just kind of get lost in that. So I'm getting lost in combinatorial mathematical theory at the moment for various reasons, and uh, and that just leads. Okay, I mean. Apart from feeling inferior and stupid all over again, um, I just learn new stuff. That brings up an interesting point and also a couple of things you mentioned earlier about chemistry, physics, mathematics. Do you think there's one underlying equation or system that ties together all of our natural forces that we're not able to see or understand at this point? Um, Probably, but I don't know if it's knowable (laughs) because I think that underlying force, um, everything we have now emerged from that after the process that we call now the Big Bang. And so I think there's, there is an interesting asymmetry in which information is lost. And so I think, I was thinking about this the other day, that perhaps there, there was a unifying, coherent, symmetrical thing, but we're never going to know what it is because we're in this part of time and, we, and we're conscious. And it's fascinating that we might never be able to recreate it because there are so many paths going back in time that we just don't know. But certainly, I, one of the reasons I'm fascinated by the origin of life and, and the fact that making a life form the lab should be easy and obvious, but yet no one has been able to do it, is that I'm wondering what is missing? What is the missing physics or the missing understanding? And the thing is to do with time and symmetry and also our understanding of how energy flows through um, time and space. So I think there's lots of in- interesting problems there, but I think more than anything, rather than becoming grandiose and coming up with a unified theory, I need to do simple experiments that are that for our results we just didn't expect. And I've got a few of those right now that I'm trying to give my chemistry experiments in my lab history. What I mean is that the outcome of the experiment depends critically, precisely on its history. And when I start to do that reliably, you know what? I'm on the path to biology. Why does that matter about the history? Well, because biology is just chemistry with history. And once I can start to create chemistry with history, I create genomics. And when I create genomics, I create biology. Interesting. And then we're, then we're approaching Asimov's uh, quantum, quantum products that we can manipulate and change. If any, is, that, is that what you mean? Not quite, not quite. I think what I'm interested in one day is um, helping humanity leave Earth, not as um, um, human beings on spaceships or robots, but um, by new instructions that we post to other planets to terraform the planet into a new type of, you know, inorganic life form. I know 
before you tell me that I'm advocating it infecting the universe with humanity. But, but um, you know, why not? Britney Spears infected pop music. <laughs> it's like the terrifying billionaire scenario. They, they create the DNA from themselves. They clone themselves and shoot embryos out into the world, <laughs> into the universe. <laughs> Then we have a yeah. billion Donald Trumps, so, uh, if he has a billion dollars, that's another story, all around the universe. Yeah, what? I mean, it's fascinating to figure out how we might manipulate matter, that's all. It is, uh, it is very fascinating. I know at the same time, you're incredibly busy. What's one topic or one person you would like to see on the show, and what would you like them to talk about? Oh, my gosh. There's one person I'd like to see on the show, and what would I like them to talk about? I, I don't know if you've had them on before, but I think it might be interesting to probably get somewhat why well, kind of like a hybrid person actually but i'll do the i suppose maybe get my friend from harvard who's moving to toronto toronto uh alan asperu gunster gunzik who is a quantum chemist making quantum computers and ask him if he could make a quantum brain that would be fun you could uh, you could, have you had george church on the on the show yet i have not so George Church is a very famous, another Harvard person. He's a very famous geneticist. He wants to clone woolly mammoths. Oh, I've, I know. I do want to get him on the show. If you know either of them, I would love introductions to get them on. And yeah, I could. I, so Alan definitely would come on. I'm not sure if George, George is a bit aloof, let's say. Just like the woolly mammoth. Exactly. No, but he's a lovely guy. I and, mean, you know, he's, he's, you know, he likes to discuss his science and he thinks deeply and um, uh, is a remarkable individual. But just busy, busy changing the world. Okay, I got one last question for you, Lee. What's one challenge question or ask you have of the audience? Okay, I, I think the, the challenge question I have of the audience is really to think about what impact you could have as an individual are being curious with the world to try and help us all to think that a little bit more critically to tell the difference between fact and fiction and and also to realize there are things which are basically right <laughs> And things which are basically wrong, and and just to help perpetuate that thing that we're taught at school for critical thinking, because you know, the world is going through a bit of a process by saying that you know facts are optional. He's facts, talking about climate change, guys. No, I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about the Bowling Green massacre. Um, you know that didn't exist. It was made up by you know uh, Kellyanne Conway on Fox News. I'm talking about countering inconvenient facts with counterfacts. And so that everyone thinks that facts are some kind of democracy. Like in the UK, because we had a UK Independence Party to be balanced, we had to give them equal time with the, the people that thought that we probably shouldn't be independent of the EU, despite they, you know, had a smaller population constituency. I, so although I know that facts are revised, because we, you know, sometimes facts do shift. I mean, Newtonian gravity is perfectly useful but i think ultimately not the best most accurate form of gravity but it works and and that basic fact is okay and so i just really would like the audience to really understand and appreciate there are facts and they are not democratically decided i think a big part of the problem in addition to just the obvious incentives here for lying is that when people hear scientists are in general terrible speakers. And when people hear scientists speaking and saying, we think or we haven't proven wrong, basically, there's no such thing as a true fact when it comes to science. It just hasn't been proven wrong yet. It's essentially a law, but it's not something that has essentially science is just waiting to get itself wrong. So you can kind of construe that to what you want it to be if you're dealing with people that don't understand science or the basic, the basic uh, nature of reality. I think it is that but the way to look at it is like, in kind of when I wake up in the morning, do I have faith the sun is going to rise, or do I have prior evidence it will? Okay, um, okay. Let's say I'm not in Scotland; I'm somewhere where it's not cloudy. And then, and I think there are some things where you can, you know, just say, okay, it's fact. I remember as a child challenging everything all the time, and it used to make me go crazy. And said, right, I don't know how, tr I don't know how, you know, a TV works. Okay, I'll open it up. I don't know how a cathode ray tube works. Okay, I'll open it up. I don't know how electron works. I open that up. I don't know whether you're like, <laughs> and you have to go at some point. You have to accept something, and whether you have to have a belief framework for that, fine. And those can be challenged, but they are so seldom challenged. They are essentially immovable. Were your parents scientists? No, my mother's a nurse. She retired now. My father is a was a builder. 
Oh Lord, so you must have been a handful then. Yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I mean, for many reasons, because I was always taking things apart. I was always kind of um, very, I realized I'm quite a direct person and I, I have a particular way of socially interacting with people, which I've kind of overcome now a bit. So I, bit, I, I was just annoying on all levels, I think. And at the same time, those are the characteristics of people that change the world and go on to do great things, which I think you've uh-huh. done and you're on the way on the way to doing. Lee, I know, I know you got a ton to do. Where's the best place for people to find you online, reach out and say, hey? Email, Twitter. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way. Skype. <laughs> and we'll throw, link, we'll throw links to everything in the show notes, guys. Fringe.fm. Just search for Lee or Lee Cronin. Lee is probably easy enough at this point. Thanks for coming on today, Lee. Okay, great. And thanks for tuning in, guys. If this has been fun, fringe.fm slash iTunes or Stitcher. Leave us a review. Share this with someone who you think would benefit. If you want more of Fringe FM, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to fringe.fm, where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. And you can follow me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM.